Uh, thank you, uh, Gary. Um, welcome, everybody, to this uh, presentation. Uh, this, is the, this is the title of my talk, uh, trying to look at how you can better uh, operate water supply reservoirs. But I think before I do that, I want to go through some slides that sort of puts the hydronation agenda uh, into context and how the um, hydronation agenda can actually uh, be used to benefit uh, from various opportunities internationally. So this, these are my own um, way of expressing the objectives of the hydronation agenda. And if you look at all these objectives without reading through each one of them, we can see that you know, there are various opportunities which could be tapped internationally, given some of the enormous problems faced by different countries in the area of water resources. And I will show you some, some slides prepared by, by the World Bank in trying to look at the situation of water resources uh, management in various parts of the world. Now, this is the global uh, distribution of water. And we could see there that it's only 2.5% of the available water in the world that is actually available for use. The rest is not available. If it's going to be available, it's going to be very expensive. And this amount is actually dwindling. So there are, uh, uh, it's very important that this amount of water is well managed. And I think Scotland has a lot of expertise in this area which could be exported to different parts of the world. Uh, this is the distribution of observing stations throughout the world as managed by the Global uh, Center for Runoff in Germany. And what we see here is that some of these stations are actually being closed in the least water developed parts of the world, uh, which means that these countries do not have sufficient data with which to actually know exactly what they have. Uh, the shorter the record that you have, the more uncertain is the decision which, which you make as far as water resources is concerned. Again, uh, some of the things being developed in Scotland could be made to help some of these uh, societies. A lot of river systems have been fully developed, and what you see here is that the scope for further development is very limited, and which calls for better management of the existing water resources. Again, I think this is an area in which uh, the uh, hydronation agenda and what has been done in Scotland can be made to bear on this particular problem. Uh, this is uh, lectured in uh, Stradus, the northeast part of my native Nigeria and Chad Republic. And what you see here is the reduction in the size of this lake over a period of time. And you see it's literally shrunk to less than one tenth of its area. And this is attributed to climate change. And riparian countries in that, in that part of the world are looking at various possibilities for reversing this which is including massive interbasin transfer to see whether people can move water from the Congo Basin to actually uh, uh, reactivate or rejuvenate this, this lake. This is a global problem. Again, some of the things being done in Scotland in terms of the effect of climate change and one could, how one could adapt or mitigate this, again, could play a role in this problem. Now, the, there's a lot of uh, things talked about uh, millennial development goals in trying to improve access to drinking water, but increasingly the coverage is still extremely very, very limited, particularly in the developing world. Again, um, we've listened to some companies this morning trying to show, show some of the activities in the area of water treatment, and I think some of those things will actually tap into these huge opportunities that exist internationally. Uh, the sanitation problem is even worse. Uh, drinking water situation is slightly better. Sanitation has not even begun in some of these places. And so we see opportunities for Scottish companies to actually not only make a difference, but also to contribute to the Scottish economy. This is the situation with the uh, MDGs. Even when you still meet the MDGs, you see have about 1.9 billion people worldwide without access to uh, effective sanitation. That's a massive market. Um, under any circumstance. So uh, wastewater sanitation projects are a big market for any uh, country that is intending to be a hydro nation. Again, uh, globally, a lot of irrigation activities going on in different parts of the world. 
uh, irrigation accounts for over 70% of the withdrawal. So there are opportunities there by which people can actually help to improve the management of water and irrigation. Uh, India uses a lot of water in irrigation, but some of that water is actually wasted. It's not put into productive use. And ways by which you can improve how you manage the water, how you better apply the water to ensure that you limit the amount of water you use in irrigation without necessarily reducing the areas being cultivated for produ food production will be quite helpful. So these are the things we do in Herio Ward as far as water resources is concerned. It's not just me. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are also involved in this. So we do all these various things without going into too much detail. And more importantly, we do advanced training in various aspects of water resources. You can see a lot of people here, international students who are doing various programs within Herio Ward in area, all different areas of water resources. So we are sort of placed, better placed to actually contribute to this hydronation agenda. I'm going to use one aspect to actually illustrate what we do, which is the water supply reservoir planning and operation to see how we can better manage water resources, especially during the time of drought. We've just heard recently from one of the speakers that Scotland itself is not immune from drought. There were occasions in the recent past when some areas of Scotland had to um, put into uh, practice emergency measures to cope with the issue of drought. So there's this concept that Scotland has a lot of water, but the variability in the climate, the variability in the amount of rainfall means that any area could be vulnerable to this problem of drought. So this is very, very within the hydronation agenda. I've taken this from the proposals for legislation, which says that we need to optimize the usage of water resources, including arrangements during periods of scarcity. And what I'm trying to discuss here is how do we do that uh, within the context of water resources management, for example. So this is a typical reservoir, which is a dam, which stores water. We have no problem, inflows, evaporation, rainfall. All these fluxes are subject to temporal variability. And whatever good intentions you have in terms of designing the system, you cannot necessarily guarantee that you meet your demand. So you must be ready to actually operate the system properly to account for this temporal variability in these fluxes. And this is where the issue of uh, reservoir operation and management comes into being. So this, this is what I'm saying about uh, reservoir operation. We need to have a system in place where we can look at the amount of water we have available and be able to meet the demand. One of the things we want to uh, avoid in water supply are large shortages of water. Uh, people are able to manage small shortages of water, provided those shortages do not last for a very long period of time. Crippling shortages are much more difficult to cope with. So one of the things we try to do for better management of water resources is to try as much as possible to limit the shortage so that it's more or less evenly distributed and avoid occasions where you have large crippling shortages in the amount of water which you put into supply. And that is just the whole essence of reservoir operation, to make sure that you distribute the water evenly and ensure that you minimize occasions where the system fails catastrophically. And this is actually done using what we call operating policies or rule calls. And this is what we have here. This is, this is an example of uh, an operating policy in which we try to meet the demand based on the amount of water which we have available. Now in this area, we don't have sufficient water, so the system uh, is releasing everything it has and leaving the system empty. And the implication of that will be on occasions where you don't have enough water coming into the system, then the amount of shortage can be extremely high. Now, this is a very simple uh, operating rule which we can use to solve this particular problem. And this thing is a, is a facility which you develop for most water supply reservoirs. And what you try to do, once you've developed this, is to make sure that if your system is operating at or above this line here, you can actually continue to meet your demand without any problem. Now, if your system is below this line, then you've got to reduce the amount of water which you put into supply. 
Now, the problem with this is that it doesn't tell us exactly how much that reduction should be. If we reduce too much, then you might be putting the consumers under severe strain because you are preventing them from having the water. If you reduce too less, then you might end up with a situation in which the reservoir completely fails and the shortages which you have in future becomes very excessive. So we need to have a way by which we can enhance this system such that we can have more precise information on the level of hedging or reduction or cutback which we have in the system. So these are the uh, problems with uh, uh, this approach, a very simple approach. But the problem is that we don't know exactly when or how much by which we should reduce the amount of water which we put into supply. As I said, if you have too little reduction, um, it might not materialize in the future because the system might become wetter and you made the decision to reduce the amount of water you put into supply. Just like what happened in, in, in the UK last year, where people were talking about droughts uh, in April, and before you know what's happening, it was floods. So you have to be very careful how much reduction. A lot of water companies in England and Wales were already planning to have what they call uh, hose pipe bounds and reduction in water use. Now, subsequently, the rains came and everything suddenly changed. So this sort of system has to be well managed to make sure that consumers are not unnecessarily penalized as a result of short-term decisions in terms of water availability. So this is what I'm saying here. If you do not manage it properly, then you end up with this situation in which the reservoir is completely empty. You don't have any water to supply. And the industries are affected. You don't want that. Um, most people are able to cope with small reductions in amount of water you put into them not these large variations in the amount of water which you supply. So we need to have a way by which we can enhance that simple tool by having hedging or target reductions within the system so that the operator would know exactly by how much you should be reducing the amount you put into supply such that we can avoid this catastrophic failure in the system. So this is the, we, we carried out um, a study which looked at two systems uh, to try and develop this enhanced operating policy and to try and use it to simulate a reservoir to see the effect of that enhanced rule curve we have on the performance of water resources systems. Okay, the reservoir analysis was carried out using simulation, the technique which we developed at, at the World University, which is a a well-behaved uh, reservoir analysis system. Um, it's called this mod uh, modified sequence peak algorithm. And to ensure that we capture the possible variations in the inflow sequences into the system, we not just base this on the historic record, we also used um, ensembles, possible future realizations, Monte Carlo to generate possible realizations of the historic. So we, we have the benefit of not just using the historic, but a large replicate of the historic. And the beauty of that, it enables you to consider the possible variations on the uncertainties which are likely in the future as a result of not knowing exactly what the future uh, will hold. So this is what we use. I, I'm not going to go into detail. This is how you summarize the results of the Monte Carlo simulation, several ensembles, and then you can combine them together to home what you call confidence limits, which gives you the uncertainty bounds for the parameter of interest. So we apply this to two reservoir systems. Uh, these ones are the ones in, in Yorkshire, uh, in England, and these ones are the ones in Iran. Uh, these reservoirs are actually used for irrigation water supply. These are water, domestic water supply reservoirs. The characteristics differ, uh, these are highly relatively highly variable rivers in Iran, and the English systems are relatively less variable, which is what we'll expect from the sort of climate you have, you have in England compared with the northwest of Iran. So these are the, uh, these are the rule curves which we obtained. Uh, this has different reliability. Somebody was saying a short while ago which return period she will apply. Now, in this particular case, we have various levels of reliability of the system, the ability to meet demand, 95%, 98%, 100%. And what we are saying is that 
depending on the reliability which you have, these are the levels which you want to maintain in these reservoirs to be able to meet your demand. This column here refers to a 30% of the demand as a ratio of the mean and a runoff at the site. This is 70%, of course. The reservoir values here are much higher than here because the demand is actually higher. Now, this is the result of the Monte Carlo. Now, what we have here is the, the mean of the control rule curve, and these dotted lines are the 95% confidence. Now, so the operator does not necessarily have to restrict themselves to this mean value, but you see this within, there's a 95% probability, for example, that the actual level of storage which should be maintained in the reservoir is between these limits. You see, for smaller drafts, this thing collapses in this period because the storage level which you have in the reservoir is much smaller than if you had a 70% draft. The capacity of a 70% demand is much higher than the capacity for a 30% demand. That's why you have this uh, collapse in that period. Now, these are the, um, the effective um, development we have in this. So in the original one which I showed you, it's just a single line which says if you are above that line, you meet the demand. If you are not, you cut back, but we don't know by how much. Now this, this set of rules here now have what you call hedging targets. So if you are here, you reduce it by 15%. Uh, so you reduce the amount of water you put into supply by 15%. And if you go below that, for example, if you are in this region, you reduce it by 30%. So this sort of uh, development enhances the performance of this rule curve by showing us the level of reduction which we should be having to ensure that the sort of catastrophic failure which we get if we do not have this sort of um, hedging decisions we have on the system. So how did this, how did these control curves actually perform when we actually simulated um, some reservoirs with it? So this is what we have. Um, for this system, this is uh, the, one of the uranium systems. So th this year was a particularly dry year. And if you use the one without any hedging, you are not cutting back, you are not reducing the amount you put into supply in anticipation of future shortages. This is what you end up with. You see, this reservoir actually emptied for about three months in the year, which is not what you want to happen to a water resource system to be completely empty. It means the impact, the vulnerability on the people using this water is going to be very, very high because you're only relying on what comes from rainfall. You don't have any backup from storage because the reservoir is completely empty. Now, when we use our newly defined, developed rule curves, this is what you have. This is the same year. You see, there's no significant reduction into failure there. And we've only reduced the uh, amount to put into supply by small amounts which the consumer can easily adapt to, rather than very high uh, failures in terms of the reduction in the amount of water in supply. You see another one, again, uh, you can see here, uh, where there's no, um, this is where we have the hedging, and there's no, look at all these various years within the system, this, these are different years. These are typical dry years in the record and there's no occasion in which the system actually emptied. Um, no responsible water resource operator or manager will want a reservoir that empties. Uh, but if you use the sort of control curve which does not have hedging targets, there's no way by which you can avoid a situation when the system is empty. Now the enhancement we put for this system means that although we are reducing the amount of water we put into supply on occasions, but those reductions are what the consumers will adapt to, and the system of catastrophic failure of the reservoirs uh, is being avoided, if you like. So, to summarize, I, I feel that the hydronation agenda is, is very timely, and it is something which the uh, Scottish um, expertise could make a huge difference, not just in Scotland, but internationally. And the simple example which I've given here um, is just a, sim a single example. Uh, the expertise we have within uh, the SBE is well poised to profit from this. I've just given you a single example 
We also do all aspects of water resources, including wastewater treatment research, including floods, uh, water conservation as we've had. So there are various possibilities for the uh, SBE and the Institute of Infrastructure and Environment to, to make a contribution in this particular area. Uh, what I've said here is very good because we have just used this to enhance the performance of reservoir. Root curves are very, very easy to use. You don't need any special um, expertise to use it. They are very simple to use. All you just need to observe is the level of water in the reservoir and compare with what you have within your root curve and make a decision. There's no uh, rigorous mathematics involved once it's developed. So this is very good. But what we have done here is to see how we can actually enhance the use of these very simple tools. And from what we've seen here, uh, it is actually possible to do that. Uh, we've done it for single reservoir systems. Um, we are now trying to extend it to look at a complex system. It's very rarely the case that water supply systems operate on single reservoirs. Uh, we've been looking at some of the things presented this morning. We, they are talking about linking up systems. So uh, water resources systems are much more complicated than single reservoir systems. And what we are trying to do is how we can extend this, this effective tool for managing reservoirs into very complex reservoir systems. Thanks very much.